Good day, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Military and Foreign Affairs Network. I am your host, the Voice of Reason. Today is March 11th, 2022, and we are continuing our coverage of the 10th day of the Russo-Ukrainian War that is taking place in Eastern Europe. So uh, first, before I start off the uh, uh, the battlefield assessment of what is happening uh, inside and around uh, Ukraine. I wanted to talk about very, very quickly uh, something that I have uh, uh, quite often noticed on some of the uh, the mainstream media networks, and that is using the uh, the term uh, when identifying a a wealthy Russian individual as a oligarch. Have you ever noticed that? Whenever we watch the news. A extremely wealthy Russian individual is identified as an oligarch. Is Warren Buffett an oligarch? Was Steve Jobs an oligarch? Is Bill Gates an oligarch? They are not identified as oligarchs. Only wealthy individuals in Russia are called oligarchs within the confines of the mainstream media news. So why do you think that is? Think about that for a second. There's a reason they do that. And uh, that is to, and it's an attempt to dehumanize the individual that they are, are talking about. Uh, whatever their stand is in terms of where they stand uh, within the, uh, the prosecution of the war, some of these so-called quote-unquote oligarchs are against the conflict and some, some obviously are not. But uh, again, uh, for the most part, when uh, the mainstream media, BBC, uh, CNN, Fox, uh, when they uh, talk about a Russian, a wealthy Russian, they usually utilize the term oligarch. Well, let's start talk. Let's start uh, calling uh, Zuckerberg an oligarch. Let's let's start talking about Jack Dorsey as an oligarch. But we don't hear that, do we? Just a just a point I wanted to quickly uh, point out as we continue our venture down uh, what we are we are looking at happening in the Ukraine. Uh, but first, we're going to go up to uh, Kiev, back to the battlefield coverage, and uh, again the the Russians continue uh, its efforts to circumvent and envelop uh, Kiev. Now we are seeing some uh, localized uh, counterattacks by the armed forces of Ukraine, uh, specifically and most recently. Uh, we have seen uh, Russian forces uh, get pushed out of this area here, uh, Bucha, and uh, again they were pushed uh, back more towards uh, the, uh, the Antonov uh, uh, air, airfield that uh, the Russians continue to control. Uh, now, with that being said, the Russians do continue uh, its advances again in a south uh, by southeasterly direction. Uh, and again, uh, the, the goals uh, of, of that uh, operation, uh, both in the west of Kiev and to the east of Kiev, uh, looks to be to eventually seal uh, Kiev off. But as I have talked about before, this is going to be a very, very difficult uh, military task uh, for uh, the, uh, the the battlefield commanders involved in this this endeavor. Uh, the Ukrainians are resisting uh, in, in an incredibly aggressive manner. Uh, they are uh, uh, fairly well equipped uh, at this point in terms of uh, anti-tank guided missile, uh, missile systems. Uh, obviously we're starting to see more and more uh, anti-aircraft systems as well. Uh, some of the more man, man portable aircraft systems that will uh, that are used against uh, some of the uh, Russian uh, heli helicopter uh, gunships. And uh, those supplies continue to uh, move into the country uh, as we speak. Uh, but again, uh, right now, uh, the Russians continue its envelopment operation uh, in and around Kiev. Uh, it looks like they're no longer attacking uh, Chernihiv in a in a direct conventional manner. Uh, they're they're using uh, artillery uh, to uh, to seal off and destroy uh, the outer edges of Chernihiv, and at times striking uh, deep inside of Chernihiv as well. 
And at the same time, uh, we continue to see the Russians exploit uh, some of its uh, breakthrough operations uh, in the east as well. And again, uh, this right here, as you can see on my map, uh, indicates that they are going to continue to press forward. Uh, and at some point, uh, they are going to uh, seal off uh, both the Chernihiv pocket uh, in the north and also, uh, it looks like they are going to attempt to seal off the western or the eastern bank of uh, Kiev. And again, uh, probably one of their uh, main military objectives at this point is the main uh, international airport. As you can see here on my map, it, it's a, it's a dual-use facility. Uh, obviously, it's used for civilian use, and it is also used for uh, military purposes uh, as well. Now, uh, our understanding is that uh, it is not being used uh, for military purposes uh, at this time, uh, as uh, as the Russians are just just too close and have the ability to shoot down uh, any uh, aircraft that would be taking off from the facility. Most of the Ukrainian uh, air assets that are taking off are happening in the uh, western uh, portions of the country and uh, also uh, through the use of uh, actual highways as, as well. But we're, again, we're watching this very, very closely as the Russians continue to maneuver and exploit this, this uh, fairly large uh, breakthrough in which they are looking to both pocket the, uh, the, uh, the uh, military units of the Ukraine that are operating near Chernihiv and then at the same time eventually uh, cut off uh, the uh, the eastern bank and the supply routes that can move into uh, eastern Kiev and then obviously also into western Kiev as well and then quite possibly at some point to meet up uh, with forces near the uh, Dnieper River uh, with these Russian forces that are maneuvering to the west of Kiev as well. But again, the Ukrainians uh, continue uh, to to be a uh, a very tenacious adversary uh, uh, in terms of uh, their resistance to the Russians. They continue to uh, mount defensive and, in some cases, defensive or offensive operations uh, as well. Uh, in other areas, we continue to see a localized uh, breakthroughs. Uh, we've we've seen this both to the north of Kiev. I'm sorry, uh, Kharkov, and we've seen it to the south of Kharkov as well. Uh, we're starting to see more of uh, some of the uh, eastern separatists uh, also uh, being backed uh, by uh, elements of the 150th Motorized Rifle Division uh, continuing its operations. Uh, we, we, we can also see here another breakthrough uh, near Luhansk to the north northwest of Luhansk, and again, uh, that looks to maneuver and eventually meet up with forces that are operating near uh, Kharkov to the uh, northwest. Uh, in the south, uh, we, we are of the understanding that uh, Maripol is being reduced. Uh, the, uh, the, the Russian military is actively using heavy artillery uh, grad rockets uh, to pummel Maripol into submission, or quite frank, frankly, uh, destroy it. Uh, luckily, uh, a lot of the civilian populations uh, have access to bomb shelters that are inside of the city. Nonetheless, uh, we are seeing the destruction of a lot of homes, a lot of infrastructure, and it will be a long time before uh, Mariupol is, uh, is again uh, in, in the state of affairs that it was before uh, the, the conflict started. Uh, but the Russians continue to drive on Mariupol. Mariupol and continue to utilize heavy artillery in reducing this city. Uh, some estimates indicate that the city could fall within the next 48 hours. Again, um, given the size of the city and the, uh, the force construct that is inside of the city, uh, of the Ukrainian military, of the volunteers that are fighting inside of Mariupol, uh, I would say at this point it could definitely go longer uh, than, obviously than 48 hours unless they capitulate. I think at this point really uh, food uh, is and ammunition is uh, the, the one thing that would become a, a, the main issue in terms of if the Ukrainians uh, continue to struggle and resist in Mariupol. Again, as long as they have food, as long as they have ammunition, uh, I believe they, they can resist. Uh, once that is cut off and they run out of those supplies, then obviously 
uh, that that becomes uh, very very much more uh, difficult. But the fighting continues in that area. We're watching it very very closely. So, again, some analysts believe within 48 hours, uh, Mariupol could in fact fall. Uh, the uh, the the uh, other area we continue to watch. Uh, the uh, the Russian uh, forces exploit breakthroughs, especially in the uh, western sector of the uh, Crimean offensive. Uh, as we know, uh, the Russians have uh, seized control of uh, Kherson and have moved towards uh, Mikhailov and uh, continue to maneuver northeast and west of uh, Nikolaev as well. And I'm going to try now and explain why you're kind of seeing uh, this sort of maneuvering uh, by the Russians. You can see them, uh, what you, would, you would believe that they're trying to, to encircle uh, Mikolaev, but in all actuality, this effort up here uh, to the north uh, is designed to secure bridgeheads. So if you look at uh, this main terrain feature, uh, in terms of the uh, the uh, uh, the river, uh, the Privdeni River uh, that runs uh, along the uh, just to the west of Mikolaev, uh, there are not a lot of, uh, of bridges on this river. Uh, if you move up uh, along the river, and as you get towards uh, the actual city, uh, there's there is uh, one bridge that can get you across. Uh, this river. And in order to access this bridge, if in fact the, the Ukrainians have not uh, destroyed it, which I do not believe they have as of yet, uh, again, they're probably going to wait and see if uh, the Russians uh, make a move uh, to, uh, to secure the bridge. And in all likelihood, I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, reason being is, again, to secure this this uh, this bridge, uh, the Russians are going to have to go through some very very dense urban terrain, and there is significant significant resistance in Ukrainian forces that have built up uh, in this city. So again, the only way to uh, access this bridge is to go through basically the center of the city, and again, a very very narrow. Uh, area of operations for the Russians to operate in as well. Uh, so this would be a very, very challenging military endeavor uh, that would probably incur the Russians' uh, significant losses. Uh, they may move up and, and secure the airfield, possibly. Uh, I, I would say that they're just probably going to uh, stay on the fringes of the city and secure access points into the city. And what we're now seeing is they're maneuvering further to the north, uh, because as you, as you see, as we move up the, the, uh, the river, uh, you will be able to see the next set of bridges that the uh, Russians can uh, operate in. And uh, you have one here. And uh, the, actually, no, it's, that's a ferry. My apologies. But the, the next set of, of bridges that the, the Russians can actually uh, seek to cross the Privdeni River is uh, up here at this, this town. And uh, there are two bridge crossings uh, here. So outside of uh, forcing their way into Mikolaev, uh, the only alternative for the Russians is to maneuver further north-northwest and establish river crossings uh, further to the north-northwest. And that makes sense because the river would narrow, and if the Ukrainians destroy uh, these bridges... Uh, the Russians could establish pontoon bridges uh, because of the narrowness of the uh, of of the river area in this in this uh, in this area. Uh, but you can clearly see what the Russians are trying to do right now. They've they uh, they made reconnaissance in force towards Mikolaev. They understand now that there's quite a bit of resistance uh, in Mikolaev. In fact, some of the uh, uh, Ukrainian army units. Uh, that were in uh, Kherson, some of the territorial defense brigades that were in Kherson uh, have since moved towards and uh, have moved into uh, Mikolaev. So again, this is going to be a very, very tough nut to crack for the Russians. Uh, so what they're looking at is sealing off Mikolaev and then moving further to the north, northwest, and establishing a bridgehead uh, over the Privdeni River uh, in this locale. And then that would allow the Russians to possibly make a move on the big prize, the third largest city, which is uh, Odessa. 
which would be the last uh, working port that the Ukrainians uh, have at this point. Uh, but again, that really doesn't mean anything because uh, the, the Russians can uh, blockade all of these ports, and they're doing that uh, as we speak. We have, we've seen an Estonian flagged ship uh, hit and sink. We have also seen a Bangladesh uh, a flagged vessel hit and, and possibly sink uh, as, as well. Uh, but again, uh, right now, it, it does appear initially that is what the Russians are looking to do is again establish bridge bridgeheads over these rivers where they can then move ground forces uh, towards Odessa. Uh, the uh, the uh, the Russian military has amphibious assets, uh, but I do not believe the Russians are going to make an amphibious landing uh, to the east or west of Odessa at this point. Uh, because uh, those forces could become isolated and, in fact, quite possibly destroyed uh, given the, the level of resistance by the Ukrainians. The Russians are first going to need ground forces that can move in and assist these naval infantry uh, when they land. They could hold out for a bit, but again, they're, they're not going to be able to hold out for any longer than a week uh, if, in fact, uh, you, uh, Russian ground forces uh, are not able to assist in operations near Odessa. So again, that's why you're seeing this happen uh, in terms of the way the Russians are moving uh, near Mykolaiv. And again, that's to secure those bridgeheads further uh, north, northwest of uh, Mykolaiv. And uh, again, it, it doesn't really get any easier. There are multiple uh, terrain features that could uh, stop the Russians as they continue to move uh, on Odessa. So this is going to be a, a lengthy campaign uh, to maneuver near Odessa. And it could be uh, quite possibly another, another week or two before the Russians are in a position where they could in fact land amphibious forces near Odessa and and then uh, have uh, the ability to uh, continue to m maneuver ground forces over, over land, over the Ukraine uh, to uh, uh, assist in any operation uh, near Odessa. But it does appear now at least the Russians want to seize the entire coastline of the Ukraine. And quite frankly, uh, right now, it would appear that the uh, the military objective, the war goal, the war aim of the Russian Federation uh, is the uh, the complete capitulation of Ukraine and seizing the entire country. Uh, they may not say they are doing that, and they may once, if they're able to, and if they're able to seize Kiev, uh, they will uh, uh, institute a puppet government and uh, and utilize some of those forces that uh, eventually will uh, gravitate towards that that puppet puppet government and you obviously have the forces of uh, of uh, e of the eastern separatists as well that will augment uh, the forces of this uh, new government uh, if and when uh, that is installed but we're getting way ahead of ourselves right now uh, this can continues to be a very very active military campaign and uh, nothing has been written in stone yet. Uh, again, the Russians continue a broad front operations typical of a Russian military doctrine. Uh, while they're probably not where they want to be uh, in terms of, of uh, the, the actual uh, prior planning of the conflict, uh, they are making progress and uh, uh, they are ob achieving uh, objectives, I would say, uh, in regards to the seizing of some of these large uh, cities, which uh, I don't think the Russians are going to do. I think, again, they're going to seal them off, especially cities like uh, Kharkiv, Kharkov, uh, Kiev, uh, cities like uh, even um, uh, Mykolaiv, Odessa, and, and some other uh, big ones as well. Another uh, a city is this uh, uh, city over here. This is going to be uh, one hell of an issue for uh, the, uh, the uh, Russians to uh, try and uh, circumnavigate. And again, this, is, this, this city is very elongated and uh, is going to be very, very difficult uh, to seal off and could possibly become uh, uh, the center of gravity in terms of Ukrainian resistance uh, in the, uh, the east. And, uh, and again, that's uh, Kriviri is, I believe, the, uh, the pronunciation of that, of that town. But uh, we'll continue to monitor the situation and report 
on all events as they warrant. Uh, again, we're continuing to monitor the situation very, very closely, and we'll have more content very, very soon. Have a good day, everybody.